It's my pleasure at this time to introduce to you Ken Davison. He's an Air Force Academy graduate. He was on the swim team just a couple of years ahead of Father Pryor. It's kind of how this connection began to grow. Uh, he was a Rhodes Scholar, uh, apparently smarter than Father Pryor. <laughs> he went on to Oxford to study a little Russian. Um, has worked much more carefully. You're going to hear more about his testimony with his holy heroes. And just the tagline for, for that effort, helping you bring the faith to your families. We've been doing this six years, and that shows up time and time again on our surveys. Help us bring this back to our families. So, Ken, our hearts are open for you to do just what the Lord is asking you to do, bring this faith back to our families. I grew up in North Dakota, and uh, my wife is from the Bronx, which means her family's from the Bronx. So um, when I first met her father, I was uh, a little nervous. Invited him over to uh, you know the apartment, and uh, wanted to make a good impression. So I, I said, you know, it's a cliche, but consider this, you know, your home. You're here. It, my home is your home. And he looked at me like the father of daughters. I understand now I have seven. <laughs> and said, so what? What? This is, treat this like this my home? And I said, yes, sir. Then get the hell off my property. <laughs> and leave my daughter alone. So uh, that didn't happen, okay? That's not really what he said, but... Um, it actually uh, brings us to, the, to, to a couple of questions because it's a couple of approaches to life that we really not need to consider. The first thing he wanted was to preserve his property, right? His stuff. And said, you know, get off my property. Well, that's actually the first question that we always think we need to ask when we're trying to bring somebody to the faith or, you know, consider... What's the cliche? Is there anything that you love more than yourself, right? But that's, that's not really what the question needs to be. That's the question that Judas asked and answered. Is there anything he loves more than himself? Yeah, he loved money. He loved uh, uh, what he could do with money. And he loved the idea of getting rid of the Romans, etc., but in the end, when he got what he wanted, he threw it all away and despaired and killed himself. So that really wasn't the right question to be asked. It wasn't that his answer was wrong, it was that he was asking the wrong question. In fact, Adam and Eve made the same mistake. You know, is there any, anything that they would want more than what, excuse me, whoa, than what they have, anything they want more. They said, yeah, well, it would be great to kind of be like God. It would be great to have this apple, etc." And that's how the devil wanted to talk to him. Uh, that was worth making a bet that God was a liar if they could get something. But that's really the distraction question. The question that we all have to ask ourselves, and it's tough for men because we like to deal in the world of stuff, is, is there any one we love more than ourselves. And that's really the question that we need to confront. And if we can answer that question, that's all the doorway that is needed for God to step in and speak to us. But before I get into that, I want to say one other thing. I, I, I did a theology degree, and I was... Uh, um, uh, able to have Father Mitch Pacwa, that I'm sure you've seen on EV10, as um, a scripture professor for a couple of years. And that was just absolutely a fantastic experience. But what he, he said, what you always have to realize is that conversion is a management issue. I'm just in sales. He said, I'm just in sales. And, you know, he would grab the Bible and he goes, and I just sell from the brochure. And I leave closing of all the deals to management. And that's another framework that's actually very helpful to us. And it's also congenial to me and any of you that have been in business. I, I was a brand manager for Procter & Gamble, and I learned to think in that paradigm. Okay, so let's just take a look at uh, uh, dealing with our families, being leaders, and, and returning to the Lord. From that perspective, we're in sales. 
We're not going to worry about closing the sale or conversion. We're going to leave that up to management. But what do we need to do with sales? We're only successful if we can get the person to agree that they have a problem or a need that needs to be solved by what we're selling. And the other thing that we need to know is that we get the right salesperson making the sale. And this is the really difficult thing for us, especially when we have a lot of zeal. Sometimes that salesperson is not you. And you've got to recognize that. And then, of course, we also have to get the right set of benefits and reasons to believe to get them to, to uh, be open to listening to how this product can serve uh, your problem or your need. So let me take you through how I fell away from my Christianity, how my wife fell away from her Catholicism, and what brought us back, how the sales process uh, worked there. And I think if we look at that as kind of a case study, you're going to recognize a lot of things that you see in your life, perhaps, you see in your friends' lives, you see in, in relatives' lives, and it may give us some pointers on how we can uh, be good salesmen. Uh, I was raised Methodist, went to church every Sunday with my family, um, uh, just fell out of the habit when I got away from home. Uh, nothing anti-Christian, nothing reasoned about it. My first year at the Air Force Academy, you're busy, you're tired. I had a room that was right across from the chapel. The only time I went to church was Easter because my roommate said, the, the girls are going to be there and they're going to be all dressed up for Easter, so you got to go. Okay. So I drifted away for a few years, and then in my senior year, my academic advisor told me I should take a Great Religions of the World survey course. That is a huge, scary thing in America today. And that class, of course, ridded me of any of the last vestiges of my Christian upbringing because I absorbed the idea that all these religions are at the core simply competing philosophies. We have many paths to God, and they're all the same. What makes these philosophies religious, I learned, is that uh, they're expressed through imaginary stories or myths that attempt to address mankind's deepest questions of existence. Why am I here? Who am I? Where did I come from? That sort of thing. And it became clear by the time we got to Western Christianity that this was really the most undeveloped and superstitious of all the philosophies, really intellectually overshadowed by Eastern religions such as Hinduism, Taoism, and Buddhism. So my newfound faith became what I termed vaguely Buddhist. And that's actually what everybody who is Buddhist is. They are vaguely Buddhist because it's, uh, it's vague. But it's actually very congenial because it doesn't make any difference if there's a God. We're just trying to get through life. And I'm not going to give you a lecture on Buddhism. But um, you don't really have any moral demands placed upon you that you don't want. That was actually a nice thing to have in reserve as I went off to graduate school didn't have any particular sins I was wildly interested in, in uh, enjoying, but you never know, and it's kind of nice to know it doesn't matter, okay? Uh, you've probably heard people um, say this to you, you know, I, I'm spiritual and I'm not religious. Well, that's what I became, okay? Now, my wife at the same time was traveling a very different route, okay? She'd been raised Catholic. She'd been confirmed everything. She'd gone through all the CCD, but after confirmation, she got no more instruction on the faith. She thought she knew everything she needed to know. She knew all the verses to Kumbaya, and uh, uh, she could make, she had collages. She could make a lot of collages. You know, this is what it was like in the 70s, all right? So she went off to actually a Catholic women's college, and that's what cured her of her Catholicism. Uh, we actually ran into a sister many, many years later, and she kept talking to my wife. She's in full habit. She's talking to my wife. She keeps asking her questions. And finally, she says, where did you go to college? My wife told her. She said, that's my order. That's my I could tell everything you were saying. That's why I'm on the other side of the country now. Okay? And that's just, you know, it's, it's, it's the scandal of people, as my wife said, who were not living the things that she knew about the teachings of the church, and even more than that, and I think women are much more attuned to this than we are, she says how unhappy everybody was, and they were supposed to be Catholic, and these were supposed to be girls that were going to a Catholic college, 
and had parents paying for them to go to a Catholic college. So she ended up going to uh, the State University of New Jersey for the last couple of years. You know, as I was vaguely Buddhist, she was vaguely New Jerseyan, and uh, we met overseas in grad school. Now, by this time, she was a she was a feminist, and. Uh, you know, we fell in love, but one time I remember we're walking down the streets of London and she makes this comment, you know, I'm not going to, if I ever get married, I'm never going to change my name for any man. And I stopped dead thinking, what is that? But she, she said, you know, how stupid could you be? Because we actually had the same last name already. <laughs> okay? Yeah, but I'm, I'm a man going, hey. In fact, um, they showed Eric Little, we're both Scottish. The name Davison comes from the Davidson clan in Scotland. Now, how many of you have seen the movie Brave? How many of you have little daughters and have seen the movie Brave? And they have these families coming from Scotland. Well, the really ridiculous ones from Dingwall, there's no such clan as Dingwall. It's the Davidson clan that's from Dingwall, which is on uh, Loch Ness. And uh, my wife actually went up there and she said, it's, it is eerie. Everything's Davison, 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 Davison. And she found out that there aren't that many Davisons left because uh, this particular clan was one of the most bloodthirsty of all clans in Scotland, but not necessarily that smart. <laughs> so they didn't know you were supposed to war with other clans. <laughs> so um, we're the descendants of those that stole so many sheep and then had to, you know, get across the, get out of town, get across to the United States. So uh, she wasn't going to change her name, but I had a decision to make on what I was supposed to do because I actually did have something to change uh, because I had transferred my commission into the Navy. So when I finished my grad school degree, I was going to go in the Navy and become a SEAL. Now, uh, one of the guys who swam on the swim team with Father Pryor and I is a SEAL. He is, in fact, the commander of all the SEALs. I spoke to him on the phone last week, and um, he had a locker right next to mine for three years, graduated a year ahead of me. So I knew what this was all about. And uh, I'd met his old girlfriend and, and uh, you know, talked to her, and I'd been and visited him when he got his trident. And so I realized it is a very singular type of lifestyle. And uh, I realized, you know, I'm falling in love with this woman who won't change her name for me, and I don't know what that means. And I'm trying to decide, do I continue my path doing what I want to do or not? And in the end, uh, I ended up giving up what I had planned to do and what I wanted to do to pursue this relationship. Now, this takes us back to the sales framework. When I was at Procter & Gamble, I was in um, pharmaceutical sales, OK? I, I was in, in brand management for, for uh, the pharmaceuticals we have in the various drugs. Now, obviously, you can't sell pan It's like, like selling Pantene or Pampers or Folgers. Those guys had a very easy job, and we always laughed at them. In addition, the guys on Pantene had a great job, because they were just doing photo shoots with all these really good-looking women. But they can tell when they've sold something because they buy it. But when we're, we're selling pharmaceuticals, we're trying to sell it to doctors who have to write a prescription. So we actually developed this approach to sales that we, we said, we're looking for hit recognition. I need to get a hit to know that you have decided to change your behavior for the product that I'm selling. I need you to show how a prescription's written out, take some samples, do some things so that you understand the benefits of this product. Well, she got some hit recognition there. She wanted two pieces of hit recognition. One, you know, that I would not go into the Navy and become a SEAL. And second, what she called the economic commitment, which was a, a nice ring. So she got that. And we went off to get married. Now, we came back to the United States, and we only got married in a Catholic church by coincidence. She's raised Catholic. Her parents are, are Catholic. Everybody in her family is Catholic, right? But in order to get married very quickly between my assignments, no Catholic church in New York can marry in less than like 18 months. They, you, you just can't get in. So they immediately discarded the idea of getting married in a Catholic church. Let's just find any chapel. And she has great stories of going all over the place and dragging her parents around to look at different chapels, slipping and sliding down 
mountain chapels, you know, in the, in the rain and trying to figure out how her grandmother would get up there with her bad hip and things like that. And they couldn't find a place. But I said, hey, I went to the Air Force Academy, maybe West Point's open. So sure enough, but the only place at West Point we could get married was the Catholic Chapel. So we ended up getting married at the Catholic Chapel. Well, of course, that raised all sorts of other issues. So now we have to agree to raise our kids Catholic and things like that. And, and I didn't particularly appreciate that, but uh, it didn't seem to be a very big deal, you know, really at that point because Carrie wasn't practicing the faith either. This is just something that we had to do. So we moved to Minnesota. And uh, along the way, we'd had our first child. And now she's at an age where we have to decide how we're going to educate her. And the schools in Minnesota are very, very progressive. New World Sweden is what we would call it. Uh, and we didn't like some of the things that were being taught. Even in kindergarten and in first grade, there was a very close Catholic uh, parish with the school. And I didn't like that idea at all of sending my kid to this you know, superstitious type of school. So uh, we met some folks down the road who were evangelical Baptists and they homeschooled. And their kids were the leaders of everything in the neighborhood. You know, they had all sorts of fun and all sorts of projects going and they seemed very nice. And uh, the wife became friends with my wife and began to, to witness to her. And the way she witnessed to her, she just talked about Jesus all the time. And they all seemed very fine and very well adjusted. And as Carrie said, they were actually happy. She'd never met any happy Catholics. Uh, so pretty soon the wife's coming down, having tea with her Bible and doing all sorts of things. And Carrie's getting very attracted to this. She says, no, she has this vaguely Buddhist husband. And she says, you know, we're in the United States. And so we started having all sorts of arguments and discussions about the faith. And we're in the West, so at least for cultural reasons, you know, the kids ought to have some sort of Western religion, et cetera. And uh, this got nowhere. There's another little pointer. A lot of times the best arguments, nothing. Uh, it just made me very, very angry, caused a lot of tension. Um, but finally, things worked out very well for her because this couple said, hey, on your husband's way home from work, there's some scientist. He's going to actually uh, lecture about some things about the Bible and they're serving dinner. So I said, great, I'll pick up some dinner on the way. And um, this was what changed everything. It was an academic presentation. This man was a scientist. And uh, he'd been irritated by the Christians at the University of Minnesota. And he decided he would disprove them with science. OK? And what he actually discovered and what he presented is that the New Testament is not philosophy. It's not psychology. It's, it's not a collection of myths. It's actually history, because that was the intention. Now, we probably all accept that. I bet you really have never had, and you, I mean, your kids, a lot of folks have never had that actually presented straight out. This is, these are historical documents. Now, all sorts of other things and, and sayings of Jesus, but these are, in fact, historical documents, and they're intended to be historical documents. And we can actually show that they are ex exceptionally good historical documents, uh, partly because you go to any uh, history faculty, and it's full of Jewish professors because their religion is a historical religion. God actually takes part in history, and this is very, very important to them. So they have recorded everything very nicely. This is the book, uh, Surprised by Faith. He went in and he said, I'm going to just take a look at the Gospels and show you that they're not reliable at all. Uh, and he discovered quite the opposite. When you look at any ancient manuscripts, you need to do three things. One, you need to determine how many copies of the manuscript exist. Okay, so you can, you can compare and contrast. You need to know whether you're dealing with one copy, five copies, or whatever. Now, up until Gutenberg, that's all you're dealing with, obviously, are copies, handwritten copies that people have had to make. Second, you measure the gap between when the original was written and when your first existing copy is. 
So, um, you know, Julius Caesar's War Diaries and the Iliad and things like this. When is the earliest copy that you have and how many years bef uh, between when it was written and that copy? And finally, you take a look at the consistency and say, how accurate is this document that we have? How similar are all the copies? Okay? And on the basis of these three tests, there is nothing approaching the Gospels. Nothing. Uh, for example, and I'll just, I'll just pull this out. You take a look at the number of copies of, like, the Iliad that we all read. 643 copies of the Iliad by Homer, all right? Aristotle, metaphysics, 49 copies prior to the printing press that they have. Plato's Republic, seven. Now, when you were in college, you read Plato. Did anybody say, we just really don't know if he even wrote this or what they, you know, whether this is accurate? No, this is Plato's Republic, all right? New Testament, in Greek, 5,309 complete copies of the various Gospels in Greek, plus 20,000 copies in translation. A little aside, remember how the Protestant Reformation is when the Bible was finally released and put in the vernacular? Only if we ignore 20,000 vernacular translations of the Bible that all existed 100 years before there was even a Protestant, okay? In every language you can imagine, including English. So he had to say, well, it looks to me like we have a lot of uh, copies of this. Um, how soon after the, the initial writing of these Gospels would you have the first copies? Again, you take a look at Homer with the Iliad. It's 500 years after the death of Homer that we can find the first copy. Aristotle, almost 1,500 years. Uh, Caesar, 950. And the New Testament, well probably 60 years. Now, the example he used is how, how are you going to be able to create a myth, make stuff up really close to the time that this stuff was actually recorded? You're going to run into somebody who knew somebody who can say that's absolutely ridiculous. What do you mean? John F. Kennedy was born in Fargo, North Dakota, and he was Scottish. You know, I, uh, my brother knows uh, his cousin's sister, you know, this sort of thing. So you're within a couple of generations, and this is when this book was written, okay? And then the final thing is you take a look at how well do they agree, because maybe you can find out that a lot of stuff was added. And this is a very common thing that you'll hear now. A lot of these things in the New Testament, they were added later. The early church decided to add it because they were trying to create certain dogmas and doctrines, and they were trying to exert power, and as a political thing, uh, or it was, you know, battles between different church leaders and the ones that finally ruled the day put things in, right? This is a very, very common thing that's said. And you'll actually will find it in all sorts of scholarly types of things, all sorts of textbooks, the textbooks that I read about the religions. Uh, but when you take a look at these 25,000 manuscripts, you find differences of 0.2%. An article might be missing. One word's missing. But when you take a look at, for example, uh, Plato's Republic, entire chapters are missing between different copies. Uh, uh, one of these, uh, uh, the folks that he quotes here, when you take a look at the Iliad, the distortion rate was 5%. And what they mean by 5% by is not an article's missing, Paragraphs are missing, chapters are missing, lines are missing in such a way that I have two copies that give a different message or a different story here. They don't say the same thing. Not just in the same way, but they don't say the same thing. So we have to choose which one we think is more reliable and which one was the mistake. You take a look at the Indian, um, uh, some of the Hindu types of writings that they've saved, you find distortion rates of 10%. It gets even greater. The 0.2% is just trying to find a distortion rate in the New Testament because nothing that was different across these various copies has anything to do with any fundamental truth of the faith, any historical fact, or anything like that. It's almost as if these were supernaturally protected 
and that people couldn't, weren't allowed to make mistakes. Or, hmm, I wonder if there might have been like an organization of some sort that made sure there were no mistakes made and put like imprimaturs are on it or nihil obstats or things like that or maybe collected the bad ones and burned them. Just a thought, okay? So now he says, I'm, I have to deal with this as history and it's real. And that appealed to me very much. I had not heard that. I had not approached it that way. And uh, off we go. I have to deal with the historical reality of Jesus Christ. And this is an historical record of what he did. He cured people, raised people from the dead, uh, etc. And he also said, I am God. That's very different from assessing his philosophy. Okay, So my wife and I took off, and uh, thanks be to God, we all took off on this conversion path together. It was, it was fantastic. I feel very sorry for anybody who their spouses are not on the same path. We began to really just go crazy and learn everything we could about Jesus and about the history, etc. And uh, uh, we're being led by these evangelical Baptists. Okay. The neat thing about it was, essentially what they were saying is, you can learn all this about the Bible, you can study, 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 and you can learn all these things, and what's really neat is, you still can pursue your individualistic type of approach. So that was, again, very congenial. We went to Bible study and everything, but uh, we, we didn't go the next step to the few times when Jesus talks about his church and things like this. It was just your personal relationship with Jesus. And I could keep this all at an intellectual level, which is actually something that I think we'll all agree men actually like to do. We like to keep stuff at arm's length. We like to put it in a compartment. I don't know if you ever heard this. They say, you know, men are like waffles and women are like spaghetti, you know. And, you know, men, we, we, we put everything in this compartment. You know, up, I'm in this compartment, I'm in this compartment. Now what? You know, I'm not in that compartment yet. I'm going to finish this compartment. Whereas women are like spaghetti, and the, the best way to do that is what I once heard my daughters say, don't ever let mom brush your hair when she's mad at dad. <laughs> everything touches everything else, okay? Now, my wife had studied in France, and she saw these beautiful things, and the Baptist churches are devoid of beauty, so she says, I don't know how I can deal with this. It looks like we're going to become Baptist. It's really, really ugly. Um, and she drove by a Catholic bookstore, came in and said, do you have a book that can tell the difference between evangelical Protestants and, uh, and Catholics? And it's got to be a short book, because my husband won't read a long book. That, that particular compartment's very small. Um, <laughs> so this is the book. I actually have it for sale. It's fantastic. David Curry, born fundamentalist, born again Catholic. And he deals with all sorts of issues, one at a time. He was raised in a fundamentalist household. His parents taught at Moody Bible Institute. He had them all in, and he explains how he realized the Bible Christians are actually Catholic and uh, began to see things in the scriptures that are in footnotes in Catholic Bibles but are nowhere to be found in the footnotes. So we began to go to these Bible studies, and then things began to have a, a, a problem here because we started noticing historical inaccuracies were we're reading things, we're picking up you know, archaeology books um, and other logical inconsistencies that are going on with these things with the friends, with our friends in these Bible studies. And there were two questions that weren't answered in this book, which is, okay, great copies kept, many copies kept, translations kept, no distortion, but who copied them? And who knew what to copy? Now, as part of my great religions, vaguely Buddhist, everything's a path to God, I'd collected all sorts of books that are now up in our attic on various religions. I had um, a lot of books that aren't in the Bible. I have the Gospel of Thomas. I have the Acts of Peter and the Twelve Apostles. I have the Apocalypse of Paul. I have the Dialogue of the Savior, the whole Gnostic Gospels. You ever heard about that? The Nag Hammadi Library that was discovered around the same time uh, that... Um, uh, all the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Um, these were writings that were in circulation 
purported to be um, Christian and uh, did not make it into the Bible, were condemned. And in fact, uh, they think that where these were found in Nag Hammadi was near a monastery, and they think the reason that they were buried and put away is because there must have been some sort of authority telling these monks, early monks, no, 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 that's not, that's not solid stuff. It's this, this stuff over here. Oh, so what do we do with it? Well, we'll just you know, put it away and not deal with it. Um, and besides, you know, the table of contents in that Bible is not inspired. And you can't identify those books without an authority, okay? So things began to be a little bit more difficult, and um, we began to read more and more books. And after the Bible studies, which we discovered were all fallen away Catholics in this Bible study, we began to invite them over to our house, and we're pulling out all these books, the early church fathers, and uh, um, we're reading these things to them. In fact, if you read a lot of the writings of the early church fathers, which are also preserved, they do so much quoting of the Gospels that you could almost recreate the Gospels from the letters and things that they've said. Okay? And we discovered, really, what the answer was for who copied these things and how they knew. And it was monks, it was the Catholics who knew what to copy because the church told them what to copy. And as you read the histories, for hundreds of years, there were some real arguments over what to include, up to and including St. Jerome, who disagreed with some things. And the Pope finally said, no, here's what you, here, here are the things you're supposed to translate. Okay? So we learned that the early church was Catholic, that it took an authority outside the Bible in order to determine which ones were inspired and which ones weren't, and there was really no way out of it. And um, uh, we continued in the Protestant Bible study, but things got really, really bad because what would happen, God has a sense of humor, and at the beginning of the Bible study, we would be handed out Bible verses to read when the time came, and then the leader would, would take us through things and go, Ken, why don't you read your verse now, you know, and would prove this point. Well, I was really kind of, I'm Scottish, okay, you know? So I would read not just the verse, but I would read the verses before it and the verses afterward, which frequently in context don't really have the meaning that you want it to have. And it caused all sorts of consternation. We weren't invited back to the Bible study. Um, and uh, I ended up entering the church in 1998. Of that Bible study, I think there's a, there is a, a uh, some sort of teaching thing, never try to do this again because all of these ex-Catholics, former Catholics, never confirmed Catholics that were invited to this Bible study, they all ended up coming back to the church. Uh, I, got, I entered the church. One of the other guys who had never been confirmed is confirmed with me. We all come back to the church. With one exception, there was one couple that dropped out of the Bible study, but they had another child, which is a bad sign. Bad sign, okay? So um, that's really how we left and came back. So if we looked at that, you know, from a sales process, what, what happened? The first thing is, we didn't know our faith at all. Even though we'd been raised in our faith, we didn't know it. And as soon as we left, not for reasons, uh, just from inertia, lack of momentum, we fell away. And then we began to come up with reasons. It became, uh, you know, rationalizations and things to never go back. The next thing is that uh, we had never really been clearly told about the historiosity of this. This is historical. It's not just what you feel or what you think or a couple of little things. These really, really, really happened. And um, when I went and pursued the theology degree, that's one of the things that Father Mitch Packle always does. He goes, first, I want you to tell me what, what it says, what it really says. There are all sorts of meanings, but don't leap too fast to these other meanings until you've dealt with the literal meanings, okay? The other thing you have to be careful of is um, sometimes the footnotes, all right? Uh, I have the NIV Bible and various other little Protestant translations, and, and the footnotes 
head so far beyond a lot of times what's there and explain things away and dismiss things. Um, but you even find that, you know, in Catholic Bibles where it gets very scholarly and the, the um, sometimes it, it, it appears to poo-poo the historiosity of things, okay? And that's a dangerous thing for, for um, young minds. You need to take a look at the plain words and the plain logics, and that can really help you, okay? Now, let me point out an example of this. You know, we have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? And you've heard they've all been drawn from Q, which no one has ever found. And it, it, so, you know, who, who cares if there was a collection of Jesus sayings or not? It makes no difference, all right? But the church has always said, and, and, then, and then you start saying, well, we don't know if Matthew wrote this. We don't know, we don't know if John wrote this. We, don't, we really don't know who wrote this and all these things. Really, we don't. We really don't. Why don't we know that? So they didn't know it back then either, but they just did this? Why are we so much smarter than somebody 2,000 years ago who had a cousin who knew somebody, you know, that talked to John? It doesn't really make sense, but that's a mindset that we have that anything modern, we must be a whole lot smarter. Now, in 1911, uh, the Pontifical Biblical Commission, Get these study Bibles that, you know, bring it right in. In 1911, one of the things when uh, you're looking at, you know, bi Bible, more Bible reading, trying to bring some things in, you see the precursors of Vatican II with them bringing in uh, more readings in the Mass uh, and all sorts of challenges to the historical Jesus, et cetera, that were coming from a lot of, you know, either Protestant sides or, or um, non-Christian. The Pontifical Biblical Commission said, we're going to take a look at this and see if there's any new evidence. What kind of evidence do we have for the Gospels? Who wrote them? Historicity, etc. And in 1911, 100 years ago, they concluded that the or original Hebrew and Aramaic version of Matthew was probably written sometime prior to 70. For a lot of reasons, including reasons that went back 2,000 years. Now, the Hebrew Aramaic version, you ever heard anybody talk about that? that the church believes that these gospels, especially Matthew, were actually not written in Greek. They were written in Hebrew and Aramaic. When you read the gospels, for example, there are a lot of really good reasons. One is um, uh, you see a lot of things that actually aren't good Greek, but you don't have to know Greek. They're, they're weird idioms. And, and as Father Mitch would say, these are actually Hebrew idioms. It's like somebody was actually giving you a direct quote. Blessed are you among women. So in Hebrew, there's no way to say the most blessed. They don't have good, better, best, okay? Fast, faster, fastest. To say fastest, you say most fast among gazelles or something, or among Scottish runners, okay? So to have him write in Greek, blessed are you among women, it's like he was actually talking to somebody who was there and said, this is what was said. There are a number of places like this. And he actually, another thing that, that Father Mitch does, and this is great for a Jesuit priest, a celibate Jesuit priest, he hit it right on the head. He goes, take a look at some of these interactions. He goes, all you married men, you'll recognize these interactions. For example, the wedding feast at Cana. They have no wine. What is that supposed to mean? What do you mean? Now, well, then your wife say, what, could you actually get them some, no. Do whatever he tells you. He says, if that isn't female, and if that isn't a male reaction, you know, she just makes a statement, what do you want? You won't tell me. I know what you want, but it, it would be nice if you actually came right out with it. He says, you see a lot of these things here seem like they're real stuff. And that's what you get if you read it, and don't worry about the footnotes and the cross-references, okay? About the time I'm converting, this book came out, Eyewitness to Jesus. It was the most heavily guarded issue of uh, um, the Times of London. And the reason it was so heavily guarded, it came out on Christmas. The college right across the street from me in Oxford, Magdalen College, had three pieces of papyrus that were from the Gospel of Matthew, written on both sides. And uh, a papyrologist, a German papyrologist, not religious, thought he'd go and visit and take a look at these things. And they had them dated. They thought it was about 200, 250. He comes and looks at this stuff and says, 
you need to lock this up. This papyrus is a whole lot older. And I'm looking at what they say here, and they had to use electron microscopes to find things because the ink had disappeared, and they're looking at indentation. He says, this is Greek, but some of the dialect and the spelling is really, really early stuff in maybe Judea. And I want to come back and investigate these. Came back and investigated them. All sorts of interesting things dated to about 50 to 55 AD. A copy, he says, this is clearly a Greek copy from Hebrew or Aramaic because this is, this is translated Greek. It's full of, of interactions from the 26th chapter of Matthew. All these pivotal points. I've got to just read them quickly because it, it'll make the hair in the back of your neck stand up. On one side, it has this fragment. Poured on his head as he was at table. When the disciples saw this, they said indignantly. Okay, preparing. And then the next one is, Jesus noticed this and said, why are you upsetting this woman? What she has done for me. This is before his death. The Last Supper. Then one of the twelve, the man called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what are you prepared to give me? And on the back of this one, they were greatly distressed and started asking him in turn, not me, Lord, surely? He answered, someone who has dipped his hand into the dish with me. And then on the third scrap, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away from me tonight, for the scripture says, and on the back of that one, I shall go ahead of you to Galilee. At this, Peter said to him, now what was so striking, and of course, vehemently, people got terribly angry in academic circles because what that has is basically the fundamental things. Jesus predicting his death, that Judas is, gonna, is going to uh, betray him. Judas betraying him. You know, it wasn't made up later. Jesus saying, I'm going to die and go ahead to you to Galilee. Um, and the other thing that's wildly interesting about it, which flew in the face of these ideas that this was all made up, was, you know, Jesus didn't know he was God. You've heard that. Or uh, the early church somewhere decided to create him as God, and you had these deification myths. In these documents, which is why they know they are a translation from Hebrew, uh, the Jews never spell out the whole name of God, right? They have what they call, you know, holy names, nomen is sacra, and they do special um, uh, things to it. The scribes would, so you would know what you're looking at, that this is the name of God and how you're supposed to handle it, but they wouldn't spell it out. They had special things. There was a whole system set up in Hebrew to handle the name of God. In those scraps, in Greek, which did not have that, in Greek, Jesus, surely not I, Lord, and then he said to them, are all treated with the same Hebrew treatment for the name of God. And these are people, as they said, who were probably eyewitnesses. Okay. This comes out, and they say, we must have had an earlier version written in Hebrew or Aramaic. Wouldn't you know, the church was right. Okay. And that's the thing that another friend of mine from Oxford who's converted, and he's now a Monsignor, he said, you know, uh, I was investigating everything that the Catholic Church taught, and finally somebody said to me, you never become Catholic that way. I said, why? He says, because if you want to determine whether the church teaches the truth, you're not Catholic. You're only Catholic if you believe that the church is a truth-teaching thing and you bow yourself to what the church teaches. Uh, that is really what we needed to be, and that's what we didn't see, and that was the other thing that we learned from this is what my wife saw, people not living the faith, being very unhappy about it, but being purportedly Catholic, and you can't tell what's real and what's not. So let me give you just a couple little stories of what's happened since then to various people. And we've got to think back. So what, what, are we, what are we selling, OK? And we're selling it by our lives, because that's what's going to make someone leave the faith. Uh, G.K. Chesterton said, what's the best argument against Christianity? And he said, Christians. 
And, and sadly, that's it. Uh, we are the greatest impediment because what we're trying to allow somebody to, to, to welcome in is the Holy Spirit. And that's the management. We just need to help that by cooperating with the Holy Spirit uh, in our lives. And as St. John in 1 John says, if anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For whoever does not love a brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. So who's your brother? We all would like to go to the story of the Good Samaritan. My brother is the one that I come across in the path. I bind up his wounds, leave him at the inn, leave him some money, say I'll check back later. If you need any more cash, I'm good for it. And we go on our way. But I want to take a look at three relationships that unfortunately God likes to put in real close proximity to us. Our children, our wife, and all those relatives. Because those are the neighbors that are actually really ordained by God. All right? I don't believe there are coincidences. You know, everything's under divine providence. But quite frankly, I had nothing to do with picking my parents. Okay? God said, those would be good parents for you. And vice versa, this would be a good son for you. God picked that relationship. When you get to your wife, you're a little bit older, you're a little bit more mature, you pick the relationship, but then you say, God, I want you to sanctify this and seal it. Okay? So those are your neighbors that are actually really close. Okay? Let me take through a couple of things. One, how are you doing as a father? Well, God came to St. Joseph and said, here's my son, would you adopt him? St. Joseph said yes, didn't have a whole lot more to say, uh, just did his job as the adopted father. We get the other way around. We're given children, and then God says, you need to give them up to me to be adopted, right? And we do that through baptism. Let me give you some stats that are pretty shocking, and it tells you a little bit about what's going on in our society. The Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate churned through actual data of Catholic baptisms, infant baptisms, not surveys, actual things recorded by the church and baptisms. 1965, baptisms as a percentage of population in the United States, 34%, down to 20% in 2011. In the last decade, it's gone from 25% to 20%. And it's not because Catholics are having fewer children, they are not being baptized. We're refusing to give our children to God. Think about that. So you have a number of people, I can't, I can't reawaken the Holy Spirit in them because they haven't received the Holy Spirit. They're still there with original sin. You probably know people like this. We were like that. We didn't baptize. We were supposed to raise our child Catholic. We baptized one. It took us a long time. How many people just don't end I'm not a member of a parish, I don't do this, I don't want to go through the baptism class, okay? Let me tell you how this works. We lived in North Car uh, Northern California. Our, we had three daughters at this time, we lived next door to these neighbors, we called them the pagan neighbors. They called us, uh, they called us the wackos from Waco, because we had a crucifix in our house, I think, at that point. We were really, really Catholic. Uh, and, and it was very friendly. Their little daughters were about the same age that ours were. And they would play with our daughters, and they would do Saint Tag, and they would do Catholic color books and all sorts of things. Christmas time, Carrie gets a call from the mom. Uh, there's something religious about Christmas. My kids are asking about it. I don't know what it is. Could you tell me? This is, this is California, OK? <laughs> all right. So remember how I said sometimes that salesperson's not you? So my wife said, how in the world do I even approach this? So I said, oh, OK, you know, here's a, you, you, here are some things, but not from me, from you. You can kind of say, here's the whole Christmas story, and maybe plant some seeds. So she did that. Um, Easter, phone call again. Hey, Hannah, their oldest daughter, she drew a picture of Jesus on the cross. She wants me to title it. How do you spell Jesus? So my wife told him how to do that. Next month. I'm off on the road, get a phone call. My wife saying, uh, Virginia, my oldest daughter baptized Hannah. I said, I said, really? 
how did she know how to baptize somebody? Oh, it's in the Catholic Girl's Guide. That's on the front page. It has the Catholic Girl's Guide, how to baptize in case of danger of death. It said, put her on the phone. Put Virginia on the phone. It says, right there, in danger of death. Pour water. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I said, well. And Virginia was eight, and Hannah was seven. I said, well, that looks like you did it. She goes, no, well, actually, it didn't work the first time, because I still had water left in the bucket from the sprinkler. <laughs> And I said, okay, Virginia, we've got to talk about repeating an unrepeatable sacrament, okay? <laughs> but put your mom back on the phone. So mom got back on the phone, and I said, you need to go next door and say, she's been baptized, quite likely, and it may not make a difference to her now, but you never know. Uh, in time, it may make a difference, and she should know that she's baptized. Wife goes over. Mom goes, yeah, 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 Hannah already told us she thinks she's baptized. My wife says, no, she really has been baptized. She explains it. One year later, mom, all three daughters, are in the church, okay? They don't know how to spell Jesus. They're on the church. Dad is not. Dad was raised Catholic, see, an educated Catholic, and he's got some issues. But he goes with them to Mass, and he doesn't go to Communion. But you don't think that, that baptism has a power and it doesn't make a difference? That, that woman is the godmother of uh, uh, one of our children. Okay? Now let's take a look at, the, you know, get your kids baptized and help them to learn the faith as real stuff that happened. Kids love to talk about this as real stuff. They're not as sophisticated as we are and try to find a way to rationalize it away. Now let me take a look at two things about being husbands, okay? If you're a husband, you gotta have a wife, right? Yep, great, fantastic. And you gotta stay married, okay? Great. As uh, Venerable Fulton Sheen says, the problem is when you get married, you make a promise you can't keep. All right. You can't do that. You need the Holy Spirit, okay? And so Jesus, who knew it before Venerable Fulton Sheen, he also knew that you can't do this, so he made it a sacrament, despite the fact that his mom wouldn't really come out with it. What do you want? Would you tell me what you want? Okay, so I'll do it. I'll make it a sacrament and help you folks out. Listen to this. 2011, our Sunday visitor published an article on the Catholic marriage rate, down 60% in 40 years. That's the raw number of marriages. In 1972, 415,487 marriages in the Catholic Church. In 2010, 168,400. And the Catholic population grew 17 million during that time. I want to put that in a ratio. The marriage rate in the United States is 6.8 marriages per thousand. Marriages per thousand Catholics, 2.6. Okay? They aren't getting married. You might not be married. Somebody you know might not be married. Because you have to be married in the church. Not because I'm trying to be mean, but because I'm trying to give you some grace so you can actually fulfill your promise. We had some friends who when I converted, they converted too. And it's worked out very nice because they have boys where we have girls, and they have one girl where we have a boy. So we're trying to work on the, on the, on the marriage all in one day, OK? <laughs> uh, let's put it this way. All you, all you priests out here, you think you know, you're probably doing a great job as a priest, and if you really need an extra boost in the Holy Spirit, maybe you'll get ordained, right? That's kind of the attitude that we go through as, as uh, uh, Catholics not getting married in the church. I want a destination wedding, I want this, I want the other thing. It's just not a marriage in the church. That's not the way it works. You need the grace, you need that sacrament. That can get kind of tough. These friends of ours, when they converted, he was a fallen away Catholic, she was a Baptist. I said, I got married in the Catholic church. He got married in the Baptist church. And he's all converted, and he goes to confession, and everything's fine. And then he's talking to the priest, and then something about his wedding comes up. And the priest says, you mean there wasn't a priest at your wedding? No. How many brothers do you have? Four or five. Your parents didn't insist there be a priest at your wedding? No. You're not married. Oh, what does that mean? 
you better sit down. Because it actually takes a while to get your marriage convalidated. And during that time, you're not married. And his wife's not Catholic yet. Uh, so I'm talking to them both. Dan says it was months and months and months and months and months when he had to live with his wife as if she was his sister till he could get married. Her perspective was, I think it was a few weeks, okay? There's a difference <laughs> in perspective there, you know? But that's real, and he did it. And the Holy Spirit has a sense of humor, so the day he got, he got married was daylight savings time, so he got an extra hour in that day, okay? Now, you know, to go back to whole, this whole sales thing, I mean, you really got to look at it and say, am I, am I trying to obey the church? Am I submitting to the church? Am I letting the Holy Spirit work in me? Am I selling it by the way I act and realize I'm just going to, when somebody asks me something, I'm going to do the best I can. I'm, I'm just going to witness to the faith by my life. I will be a sign of contradiction. I'm not trying to plow on people to convert them. I'm, I'm leaving that open. I'm not going to say I'm not going to, you know, ask questions, but I'm going to try to understand who do they love more than themselves, you know? That's what's going to motivate them at the end of the day, and if they're not at that point, they're not going to be there. So let me leave you with one last thing. Relatives, okay? Um, so uh, my, my father, I decided, you know, I, I, I would really like him to come into the church. Right. So um, St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, says in your first communion, whatever you pray for actually will, will be done. So I pray for my father to come into the church, you know, to uh, go to heaven. And I'm working. I'm looking for opportunities. I'm doing things. I packed up these books. I mailed them to my dad and said, I just want you to know what I went through. My mom intercepts them, sends the letter and the books back. Don't do this anymore. So as the years go by, I never really got the opportunity, although I got some opportunity to talk about living the life as we had more and more children. And he's saying, this is just really strange. And um, I never got to be as direct as one woman I heard. It was, it was very, very funny. She was getting pressure from her father-in-law. Uh, actually, her husband from his father was, she came in in a conversation. He's going, good grief, how many kids do you have? What's the matter with you? Are you some sort of rabbit? And, and she happened to be walking in, and, he, and she says, you know, you know, Dad, I can't help it. I'm just irresistible. <laughs> that was the end of that. Uh, but, you know, my dad stopped asking, and uh, uh, I actually it quit my job. Ten days before he died, he uh, went on hospice, and by the time I got there, spent the last ten days with my dad, uh, with him, but the toxicity was, you know, increasing, and, and I'm saying, you know, Therese, you fooled me somehow, you know. Uh, this doesn't seem to be working. Um, you know, so my dad died a couple years ago, and I guess I wasn't the salesman or I wasn't the right salesman, but let me tell you a different story with my wife. And a cousin, Uncle Jim, who's very much a hermit, great guy, never married, lived upstairs in his mom's house, 70-something years old now, um, had, a, had a twin brother who died when they were about 16. And uh, they'd been very close. They'd gone to Catholic school together. And within a couple, after the Catholic high school, you know, Uncle Jim didn't want to go to anything Catholic anymore and stopped going to church, and nobody in the family forced him to do it. So one Thanksgiving, we invite ourselves over. We show up at Thanksgiving with all our kids to a poor hermit guy, lots of girls, Gabby, 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 Gabby. And what he would do is he would just disappear up to his room when he couldn't take it anymore. And it's uh, Thursday for Thanksgiving and Friday. So Saturday, we're saying, where are we going to Mass? Uh, I'll get you some things for Mass. You know, I don't go to Mass. No, you, Uncle Jim, my wife's saying, you can come to Mass. Let's come to Mass. Though. And he says, uh, no. I don't really need to. I don't really need to. I'll get you some things for Mass. And so my wife keeps pestering him. And um, Sunday morning comes, and he doesn't even come down out of his room. He stays upstairs. He's waiting until we leave. My wife's hollering up the stairs. Hey, Uncle Jim, we're getting ready to go to Mass. You can come with us. No, 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 I'm okay. I'm okay. 
Hey, Uncle Jim, we're not really sure. We don't want to get lost. Maybe you could, we could follow you or something. No, 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 no. I don't want it. No, I don't want it. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm like you. I'd say, leave the poor guy alone. Leave the poor guy alone. Okay? Which is, of course, not the Catholic thing to do, is it? Uh, but it's very male. We're out in the van. We're pulling out. I'm so happy everybody has their shoes on. And my wife says, stop the van. Why? I'm going to go in and talk to him. Oh. She gets out. She stomps in. She's from the Bronx, right? OK? She's Scottish. Stomps in the house. A few minutes go by. She stomps out. Gets in the van, slams the door. Let's go. I said, what happened? She doesn't get a chance to reply. Uncle Jim comes running out of the house. Follow me. Runs, jumps in the car. Follow me goes to Mass, stands behind, you know, at the back of the, uh, doesn't go up to Communion. And uh, since that time, he goes to Mass every Sunday. He's changed his work schedule. He used to work on Saturday. Changed his work schedule and um, goes to Mass. And you get emails from him. He's talking very Catholic. What happened? She ran up, pounded on the door, demanded he open the door. and said, what are you doing? Not going to Mass. He goes, I don't need to go to Mass. She says, do you ever want to see your brother Stephen again? There's only one place you will see him again. And that's in heaven. And you both have to be there. So do you not think he's praying for you right now so that you'll get there too? And he just looked at her and said, no one has ever said anything like that to me before. And she said, I'm very sorry no one has. but somebody should have. And then she left. OK? Sometimes that's what you can say to the relatives. If you know if there's anyone they love more than themselves. And they'll hear it. So I said my father died a couple years ago, and I thought Therese didn't work it out right, and I don't know what the deal is. But uh, the last full day he lived was her feast day. And uh, I'm helping my mom with the funeral uh, arrangements. And she goes in there and she says, OK, we're going to you know, get this. We need to get flowers. I'll get some flowers. Do you know how, what's the rain, what St. Therese said? I'm going to be in spend my heaven doing good on earth. I'm going to send down a shower of roses. Okay, People pray to her for real clear direction. And they see roses you know, in places, uh, usually yellow roses. So I go with my mom, and we're going to a couple of places. They're trying to do it really quickly. It's not a good time in Missouri. And we end up in a flower shop, and they say, well, we don't really have any lilies or anything good. We have roses. And uh, she says, oh, OK. And so my mom says, well, I'd like roses. I can't even think of what color. And they said, we only have yellow. And so my mom, mom goes, hmm, I don't know. Um, looks at me and says, can we have yellow roses at the funeral? What? She says, what do yellow roses mean? Because your dad would always get them for me. So I'm hoping that what they mean is I better be running out of my house and making sure my family's coming with me so I can see my dad again. God bless you. Thank you.